in this video, we'll be walking through a very simple example of using the FFT function, the fast Fourier transform, which is the most common, most widely used implementation of the discrete Fourier transform, right? This is the, this is the version of the Fourier transform that is actually applicable and usable numerically. It can be run by computers quite efficiently. And there's a couple of nuances and tricks to figuring out how it works. So let's walk through them here. We have a underlying signal that we're talking about. There's a signal span, and I'm just creating an array from zero to uh, two pi, and I'm going at increments of pi over four. And so that gives me a value of eight samples. You can check it if you don't believe me. This is all being done again in, in Google's collaboratory, which is a version of, of Python Jupyter, of Jupyter Notebooks in Python, uh, freely available for anyone who wants to sign up for a Gmail account and just open it up in Google Drive. Very useful uh, to have access to a, a nice deployable Python environment that you can just sort of play with and you don't have to really tweak or manipulate. The signal that we're gonna be looking at is the sign of that, um, of that signal. So I'm taking this is range and I'm calculating sign over it. This NP here represents NumPy. If you look up here, I've, I've imported NumPy as NP and matplotlib.pyplot as PLT. These are the tools we'll be using to, to uh, probe and explore here. Then, now that I have my eight points that have been passed through my, so, my, my, so these are my domains of the eight points. These are the T values and this is my, my S of T or my F of T. So my signal itself is sign of those eight points. And so I get eight points out there. And if we wanted to, let's actually just run this real quick so that we have something to, to look at. Um, and I'm gonna add a new code block and we're just gonna look at signal span. And so we have an array that goes from zero to pi over four to pi over two to you know, three pi over four, whatever it is. And then I've got signal in, which is the actual sign of that. So let's take a look at that real quick. And that's going from zero to um, root two over two to pi over two. All right, these are the, these are the different points in, in the unit circle. So it's um, zero, root two over two, one, root two over two, zero, because we're now Again, the y, we're looking at signs, so we're at the y, y value, so it's, let's just annotate it real quick, right? Sine of zero is zero, because that's the y value. Then here, it's root two over two. Here, it's one, root two over two, back to zero. And then over here, we're at negative root two over two. Here, we're at negative one. And here, we're at negative root two over two. Great, so we're looking, looking at the y values, right? Y values. Okay, so that's our input signal. Now we've got the FFT. So I took m, m, uh, numpy.fft.fft, that's the actual function to call it, that's how you do it, and you get FFT out. And this gives you, again, eight points. This is very important to understand. The number of points you take, you pass into the FFT is exactly the number of points it will give you back out. So if I look at the length of signal in, and I compare it to the length of signal FFT. I'm going to get the same value, right? They're both length eight. Number of points you take in from your vector that go into the FFT, um, come out the FFT. Okay. Now, the power Right, so at signal FFT gives me values that are, that are complex because that's what the Fourier transform does. It's a complex function. And so I'm getting values that can give me, these are Cartesian, right? Real and imaginary points. You can take the magnitude and the phase of those. Now here, I'm just gonna take a look at the power. So I'm taking the absolute value of this, of this complex value and I'm getting out FFT power. And this should give me eight, eight signals um, that are only with respect to, to the magnitude of the FFT. 
And you can see that for almost every point, I've only actually got two values. I got zero and I have four and that's it. These are all like negative 16. These are close. These are floating point approximations to zero. So now let's get rid of this and let's actually plot the FFT. So that's what I'm doing here. And we see that it looks like this. Now this doesn't look like the Fourier transform that I described before, right? What were we expecting to see? We were expecting to see a plot that was zero everywhere except for four. And sorry, uh, except for one. That was one and negative one. So this is the plot we were expecting to see, and we don't see that. Instead, we look at something that's very weird. And the reason that it looks this way is because the output of the FFT function isn't in this format. It's in a slightly different format. And that can be confusing at first, but it's done primarily for numerical efficiency. But it's also very straightforward. The, the, the FFT's indices tell us something very explicit about what's going on and why it looks the way it does. Let's see if I can find uh, or describe this, um, describe this cleanly. This value here, this zero value here, is always going to be the DC value of the Fourier transform. What, is, what does that mean? What this means is that is that if you're looking at just the DC offset of the signal, then you look at index zero. Now the subsequent indexes are going to be marching through the frequency bins of the, of the Fourier transform, of the, of the DFT, but it will depend on whether or not the number of samples that were passed into it were even or odd. And that seems a little weird, but it's just the way it works. And so this guy is DC. This guy is a frequency bin that is representing the data, the bin from from that is greater than DC, right? So greater than zero, but less than this way, but less than some Nyquist frequency divided by the number of samplings that we have in our sampling rate. And that seems a little messy, but it, it will make sense in just a bit. So we'll say that this is some frequency of the Nyquist divided by some bin value. And then because this was an even number of samples that came in, we get two more samples. Then this represents the Nyquist sample. And then these represent the negative frequencies and they represent the negative frequencies in decreasing order, such that this frequency, this point, and this point represent the same frequency bins. And if this happened to be an odd number of samples that were passed into, right? Here we passed in even, which were eight. If we passed in seven, then we simply wouldn't have a Nyquist frequency point. The Nyquist frequency point, mind you though, is, is duplicated for both the positive and the negative frequencies. In fact, all of these are duplicated. This five and this three are the same value in terms of power. This represents the positive frequency that's cl second closest to Nyquist, and this represents the negative frequency bin that's second closest to Nyquist. 
because I, I, we know, because I simply told you, right, that we're sampling here at a rate of eight hertz, then the Nyquist frequency for this is four. And if the Nyquist frequency is four, and we have one, two, three, four samples to get to Nyquist, then we now know what this range represents. This range represents zero, the bin zero to one. This range represents one, not including one though, F less than or equal to two. This is two to three inclusive, and this is three to four inclusive of four. That's what's going on here. That's what this is talking about. If you don't believe that this is the way it works, let's make a very quick modification. Let's come back to this. And let's just add three. Shift everything up by three. How will the plot change? Look at that. Everything is the same, but we have a DC value that jumped all the way up to here. And the reason it jumped all the way up to here and why this is a value of, of 20 something, right? Why this is a value of four is because technically in order to get it to represent the frequencies of interest, right? We have to divide everything here by the sampling, by the, um, uh, we have to divide everything by four, which is the Nyquist frequency. Or sorry, two X the Nyquist frequency. Yes, two X the Nyquist frequency. Eight, basically divided by the sampling rate. And so now you got to three and you're saying, well, hang on, why are these at half? Well, it's half because if you want the full power, you have to take this point negative frequency and flop it back onto this and do the same for all of these. And so right here, we added three, there's our DC offset value. And we've got half, zero, 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 Nyquist, zero, zero, half, and this half is the negative frequency component of this zero to one hertz. So remember, this is zero to one hertz, that's the DC. So there's an actual way to then redo, right, and remap this plot so it looks better to us. And that's what I did down below. So let's go in here and take all of our power and let's properly divide it by eight. Divide this by eight. Actually, we'll do the DC value divided by eight. And we'll power here divided by eight. We'll plot this, and lo and behold, we have my, all of this taken together. And should we want to, if we just took all of these points and flipped them over, so that this one was here and added, this one was here and added, this one was here and added up, and this one was here. And so we only had our a positive version, right? We only had this, and we took all of these and we flipped them over. Then this would go up to one, and that's what we expect, because again, we were looking at just a sine wave, sine with omega one with an amplitude of one, and all the others should be zero. And that would recreate the, the proper power, the one-sided power of our FFT. Without that, we've got something that looks pretty good, right? It looks like the FFT of interest. So if I go back here and take off this three, I can plot that, plot that, and now we're back to now we're back to the plot that we were expecting, right? The one where we have the peaks only at the one frequency component, right? So this represents frequencies zero, greater than zero, oops, greater than but not including zero, F, one inclusive, this is zero less than, by the way, mm, not this way, sorry, F less than or equal to negative one. And that's why this and this are sitting at half. And this is how the FFT function works and how you can interpret it. Remember, that I copied the Nyquist point here. So this has been duplicated it's on both sides, right? This value four here has been duplicated on both ends. If you have an odd number of points going into your FFT, then this point will not exist and you will simply have points up to and you will be missing your Nyquist point because 
you've plotted, you've put in an odd number of points into your sample. And this is the basics for how the fast Fourier transform, which is the most common implementation of the DFT, the discrete Fourier transform, works in computing.